This hearing of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee will come to order. It has been more than two decades since Congress passed the Victims of Trafficking and Violence Protection Act, and yet today, men, women, and children are still bought and sold in virtually every country in the world. It is an absolute travesty that traffickers are preying on Venezuelans fleeing for their lives from their country, on migrants desperate to escape hunger and conflict in the Horn of Africa. And it is despicable that they take advantage of Putin's invasion to exploit Ukrainian refugees, 90% of whom are women and girls who are desperate for protection from sexual violence. The vast majority of trafficking victims are women and girls. If we are serious about combating human trafficking, the United States must redouble our support for policies and programs that empower women and girls as we tackle the root causes that open the door to such exploitation. Ms. Dyer and Mr. Walsh, I commend the work both of you and your departments are doing. I know it's not easy and we have made meaningful steps in recent decades, but despite elevating the issue to a global scale and putting in place legal frameworks to hold traffickers to account, about 25 million people still live in what amounts to slavery. Traffickers still rake in an estimated $150 billion annually. So I hope our witnesses will speak about what the United States is doing to address the root causes that leave people vulnerable and the prevention efforts to stop would-be traffickers. Ending extreme poverty, ending gender-based violence so that many women and girls endure uh, so that many women and girls endure whether it is sexual exploitation, domestic servitude, and forced marriage. Fixing a broken migration system here in the United States that allows coyotes and other human smugglers to force children into debt bondage. Forced labor trafficking is ultimately the result of governments failing to protect workers' rights. When employers don't respect labor laws, it creates an environment where workers are vulnerable to exploitation. Any approach to combating trafficking must begin with empowered workers who can stand up for themselves. That means reforming labor laws to protect migrant and domestic workers. These victims of human trafficking are cooking, cleaning, gardening, and taking care of children. They often work 16 hours a day for little or no pay. I have fought to make sure that the State Department's Trafficking and Persons Report, which just came out last week, serves as an unbiased, powerful tool to combat trafficking and I've pushed back against administrations of both parties who would have politicized the report because I believe this is a problem that needs to be addressed in a bipartisan manner. Senator Risch and I have reintroduced the International Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act, which passed the Senate in the last Congress. It will strengthen our ability to hold governments accountable and expand prevention efforts at the U.S. Agency for International Development. And it will help combat trafficking of domestic workers by diplomats and UN officials here in the United States. We also need to hold governments accountable for their failure to take basic steps to address human trafficking. Talking about holding China accountable for its reprehensible use of forced labor in its Belt and Road Initiative. I'm talking about holding Russia and Cambodia and Eritrea accountable. And I'm talking about holding the United States accountable as well. I'll end by noting that this year the government settled a case where more than 100 mostly Spanish-speaking children were working graveyard shifts at our nation's largest slaughterhouses. That's dangerous work, hazardous machinery, industrial chemicals, extreme temperature changes. Some of them were just 13 years old. To me, that's completely outrageous and unacceptable. The head of the Alabama Office of Homeland Security Investigation said, quote, as the government, we turned a blind eye to their trafficking, close quote. And the New York Times article went on to say, quote, he teared up as he recalled finding 13-year-olds working in meat plants. This is not a problem limited to some far-flung corner of the world. It is a problem we see at our southern border, and it is a problem that stretches into the American heartland. So we in the United States need to be doing everything in our power to end global human trafficking. I think we can do better. I think we can do more, and I look forward to doing that. With that, let me turn to the ranking member, Senator Rich for his remarks. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm hopeful that our bill will uh, get uh, completely through the process. It, uh, there's absolutely no reason it shouldn't. Um, as we all know, millions of people are trafficked every year. Traffickers uh, prey on the most vulnerable, 
uh, trapping them in a horrific cycle of abuse that often goes overlooked. The children, young adults, women and men that are coerced into forced labor and sex trafficking have their autonomy stripped and livelihoods uh, damaged. Addressing this global scourge requires an international commitment. The United States is the leading global voice on combating human trafficking and has been so for decades. We provide training, consultations, and aid to civil society and government actors around the world to better prosecute traffickers, prevent further trafficking, and protect victims. It is a shame, however, that some governments participate in state-sponsored patterns of trafficking and further victimize the most vulnerable. Other governments become indifferent to trafficking and offer no permanent solutions to ending the pattern in their countries. Thankfully, there are some countries that have put significant investment to combating trafficking and protecting uh, victims. We recognize their efforts and thank them uh, for this enduring pledge. I look forward to hearing today about what the department sees as biggest challenges and biggest opportunities. I equally look forward to hearing more about USAID's important role in combating trafficking and what more can be done. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Risch. Uh, we have the distinct honor to welcome Cindy Dyer, our ambassador at large to monitor and combat trafficking in persons, and who leads the State Department's office to monitor and combat trafficking in persons. Ambassador Dyer is a human rights advocate and lawyer with three decades of experience working at the local, national, and international levels to prevent and respond to human trafficking, sexual assault, and domestic violence. We're also uh, honored to welcome uh, Johnny Walsh, the senior bureau official to the Bureau for Development, Democracy, and Innovation at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Prior to his current role, Mr. Walsh served as USAID's Deputy Assistant Administrator for Democracy, Human Rights, and Governance. Previously, he served as a senior expert at the United States Institute of Peace, a senior policy advisor for the Middle East and South Asia at the U.S. Mission to the United Nations and as the State Department's lead advisor on the Afghanistan peace process. So we welcome you both. We appreciate uh, your uh, willingness to come and share insights with us. Uh, your full statements will be included in the record without objection. I'd ask you to summarize in about five minutes or so so we can have a conversation. And Ambassador, we'll start off with you. Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Risch, um, thank you so much for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Department of State's efforts to combat human trafficking and for your leadership on human trafficking. I especially want to thank Chairman Menendez, Ranking Members Risch, and Senators Kane and Rubio for sponsoring the International Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act of 2023, which recently advanced through this committee. Just last week, Secretary of State Blinken uh, presented the 2023 Trafficking in Persons Report. The TIP report, which my office produces annually, contains narratives detailing global anti-trafficking efforts, including those of 188 countries and territories worldwide, including the United States. It is the world's most comprehensive resource of governmental anti-trafficking efforts, including our own, and reflects the U.S. government's commitment to global leadership on this key human rights, law enforcement, and national security issue. This year's report contains some good news. Across all data points included in the global tally, Traf uh, including trafficking prosecutions, convictions, and victims identified, there were increases reported compared to prior years. This progress is due to real change in policies and ongoing improvements in government's collection and reporting of law enforcement data. Convictions continued to increase, and identifications of victims and potential victims increased by nearly 25,000, although neither was back to pre-pandemic levels. This year's TIP report includes 20 countries with ranking downgrades, including Slovenia and Namibia from Tier 1, and the Dominican Republic and Egypt, among 11 other governments, down from Tier 2 to Tier 2 watch list. There were 24 whose ranking improved, including two countries, Denmark and the Seychelles, upgraded to Tier 1. While the tier rankings are important, the TIP report is, above all, the U.S. government's principal diplomatic and diagnostic tool to guide relations with foreign governments on human trafficking, with the narrative and recommendations a roadmap to improvement, and the rankings a means to encourage governments to increase and improve their anti-trafficking efforts year after year. 
The TIP report also includes an introductory essay on how effective efforts to combat human trafficking require partnership to complement and support the 3P paradigm of prosecution, protection, and prevention, a topic I shall return to in a moment. The report also includes special interest boxes on a variety of timely subjects and emerging trends we have documented, including forced criminality in cyber scam operations, unscrupulous online labor recruitment, the challenges faced by survivors who are boys and men, and audit deception. Cyber scams in Southeast Asia, including in Burma, Cambodia, Laos, Malaysia, and the Philippines are a growing form of forced criminality affecting victims worldwide. The 2023 TIP report narratives reveal that victims from at least 35 countries and areas have been identified. The scope of these operations is shocking. An international justice mission report, for example, estimates that up to 100,000 people in Cambodia are working in scam operations. These schemes often target young and educated professionals, including Americans, who respond to virtual offers of employment only to have traffickers seize their passports and coerce them into enticing strangers online to join fake cryptocurrency investment schemes, deposit money into gaming accounts, or buy into false romance and investment schemes. I spoke about the need to address forced criminality amid cyber scams at the OSCE's 23rd An Alliance Against Tra Trafficking in Persons in April, and earlier this month, Principal Deputy Director Kerry Johnstone spoke at the OSCE and Council of Europe about this growing menace. And we are focused, as always, on promoting a victim-centered and tr trauma-informed approach so that victims are not inappropriately penalized solely for unlawful acts they committed as a direct result of being trafficked. Turning back to this year's TIP report, the introduction focuses on a fourth critical P, partnership, which has long been essential to the success of the 3P pain framework. As ambassador, I am focused on implementing key actions to advance an effective anti-trafficking response, including addressing human trafficking in the context of the impact of Russia's war, documenting and decrying human rights trafficking in Xinjiang and elsewhere in the People's Republic of China, as well as the PRC's Belt and Road Initiative, engaging with survivors, and preventing human trafficking in global supply chains. Chairman Menendez and Ranking Member Risch, thank you again for holding today's hearing and this committee's steadfast commitment to combating human trafficking. Thank you, Ambassador. Mr. Walsh. Thank you, Chairman Menendez. Thank you, Ranking Member Risch. Um, thank you for the, your leadership on combating human trafficking, the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, this is such an awful crime all over the world, um, including at home, as you rightly pointed out. Um, I would just start by saying I think that those who dedicate their lives to fighting it are doing genuinely heroic work. So I just want to acknowledge the amazing efforts of staff who work specifically on countering trafficking at USAID and at the State Department, um, and then the huge network of activists, civil society, our implementing partners who work with us um, really all over the world. So. More concretely, since 2001, USAID's provided a little over 370 million in counter-trafficking assistance in 88 countries. Um, currently, USAID supports CTIP efforts, some of them standalone, and some of them more directly integrated with our other development work in 35 countries. In FY 2022, we obligated 32.5 million into counter-trafficking work globally. That's more than three million above our earmark, which indicates how important our missions consider this work on their own among the many priorities that they're trying to address. Um, as I say, beyond our direct counter-trafficking programming, a large fraction of USAID's international development work helps to counter-trafficking, either by addressing its root causes, which range from conflict to corruption to poverty, gender-based violence, national disaster, natural disasters, a lack of opportunity, um, or by building local capacity in ways that are directly relevant to the fight against trafficking. For example, supporting stronger judicial systems, supporting the rule of law. And I think that USAID's effectiveness in this work 
rests on a strong in-country presence where we're working through our missions that allows us to design and effectively monitor our work in a way that's informed by and adapt adaptive to very local context on the trafficking problem as it exists in any given place. So similar to the State Department, we embrace what we call the four Ps, um, prevention, protection, prosecution, and partnership. Um, that's how we break down our work in this regard. First, to touch on prevention, we worked, for example, to raise awareness of trafficking, particularly with vulnerable groups, high-risk communities that are often preyed upon. Um, that can mean promoting public information and education campaigns. Um, these will cross source, transit, and destination countries for trafficking. As one example, in Colombia, USAID is working in high-risk communities to protect the rights of Venezuelan migrants who are vulnerable to trafficking. And this program is, it does many things, but in this context, it raises awareness about the different methods of exploitation. Um, we complemented that by training almost 4,000 service providers on how to address gender-based violence over the last year. That's just one example. To touch on protection, second, um, to protect trafficking survivors, USAID's approach and State Department's approach is survivor-centered and it's trauma-informed. And so we support reintegration assistance for survivors. That often means psychosocial and medical services. It can mean legal assistance, um, safe and secure accommodations for people who may still be at risk, um, access to employment, to business opportunities, all of this to help survivors rebuild their lives and to avoid being re-victimized. Um, third, on prosecution, this lives principally with others, but USAID absolutely helps with the development, for example, of anti-trafficking laws with significant penalties for traffickers and protections for victims. Um, we provide victim-centered training and technical assistance for law enforcement officers, for prosecutors, for judges, so that they're maximally effective um, and, and compassionate in helping trafficking survivors and, and prosecuting perpetrators. Um, as an example, we're working across the Caribbean region through our Caribbean regional mission to improve the prosecution of trafficking cases. We help countries develop or strengthen national referral systems, referral mechanisms. So that means training local law enforcement to better screen and identify and investigate trafficking cases. And fourth, on partnerships, I'd just say there is no way to do this alone. Um, we work across governments, civil society, faith-based organizations, advocacy organizations. We're all in it together, and we view it as an all-hands-on-deck approach. Um, as one example, in Senegal, USAID has used partnerships across each of the categories that I named to promote a coordinated, community-based, almost whole-of-society approach to combat forced child begging. And it's hard to think of a more a population more vulnerable to exploitation than children who are begging. But we can build on years of lessons from prior programming, and we can work with government, religious leaders, community leaders, local shelters to reduce forced child begging, especially in urban areas where this program operates. Last thing I'll say for the moment is uh, in December of 2021, USAID revised our whole of agency, CTIP, counter trafficking policy, to align with the US government's revised national action plan to combat human trafficking. And a couple of the priorities that we really brought out to infuse into the work of our field missions are, as I say, survivor-centered approaches, partnerships across government, civil society, private sector to work together against trafficking, better coordination with other parts of the US government, um, extensive use of evidence and learning, which we gather from all of our trafficking program, programs and apply to our work going forward, and delineating clear roles and responsibilities for staff across USAID. Um, for example, if they detect trafficking ad adjacent to any of our own programs. Um, this revised policy, its associated CTIP field guide, help our missions to design, implement, monitor, and evaluate their work um, and together they serve in effect as, in our minds, our implementing guidance for USAID for the TVPA. So Chairman Menendez, Ranking Member Rich, thank you for calling this hearing. We emphatically share the belief that no single entity, whether it be government, our implementing partners, different parts of our government can do this alone. 
um, I get to combat a crime as complex as trafficking. So thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. We'll start a round of five-minute questions. Uh, Ambassador, um, you mentioned in your remarks some countries who were downgraded, uh, including the Dominican Republic, uh, to a Tier 2 watch list. Is that because of what is happening to laborers at the uh, sugar uh, um, mills that are taking place? I saw some uh, reports of labor issues there. Thank you for that question. The reason that the Dominican Republic was downgraded, the full details are in the narrative, but the highlight is that they are not appropriately screening um, their migrant workers, nor are they referring migrant workers to services, and they are not offering services to those who have been identified as trafficking. Um, this was a case where we actually spoke about it in depth, and we are very concerned about this you know, systematic exclusion of providing services and even referring or screening the victims. And so that, that was the reason for their being downgraded. I see. Because there's, there's labor reports about uh, the sugarcane refineries in the Dominican Republic using underage individuals and uh, uh, basically uh, not providing certain fundamental labor rights to its citizens. I, I'd commend that to your attention uh, as well. Um, Cuba is once again a tier three country in the annual trafficking in persons report. The Cuban regime actively employs forced labor practices through its foreign medical missions program. As the TIP report notes, by the end of 2021, Cuban medical missions were exported to close to 60 countries where such workers were regularly threatened, denied salaries, forced to work under exploitive conditions, and had their travel documents seized. Um, obviously, the Cuban regime won't end this inhumane practice. What concrete actions has your office taken to elevate the voices of victims of the Cuban regime's human trafficking scheme and to develop a diplomatic campaign to end these forced labor practices once and for all? Thank you for flagging this critical human rights abuse. I think the most important thing that the, that the office is doing, number one, is in addition to calling out Cuba's horrible state-sponsored trafficking of their medical personnel in the Cuban narrative, we actually call out every country who is hosting and therefore providing money and supporting Cuba in that state-sponsored program. We listed this in 56 country narratives in the Trafficking in Persons report. And this, as you know, this tip report is what drives our foreign diplomacy. So we are not only calling it out on, in the Cuban narrative, but also in the 56 country narratives that are by their using these medical personnel supporting that regime. You know, this is... Uh this is a set of circumstances where Cuban doctors and other medical personnel are sent to other countries. Uh, the country pays Cuba, not the medical professionals. Um, they take the passports away of these medical professionals so that they can't leave, uh, and they are, in essence, hostage. Um, and it's the equivalent of slave labor from my perspective. And so these countries uh, who are participating in this is, um, is equally um, uh, as vile as, uh, as, the, as the Cuban government's um, uh, use of these individuals in a human trafficking case. Let me ask you this, Ambassador. The Government Accountability Office investig investigation in 2020 concluded that evaluating the effectiveness of anti-trafficking foreign assistance is difficult due to limited data, a focus on outputs versus over outcomes, and limited evaluation resources, among other factors. Uh, what steps are you and the department taking to sharpen our ability to successfully evaluate the effectiveness of our counter-trafficking assistance? Um, the effectiveness of our program is of paramount concern to both me and to the entire office. Ironically, I was a trafficking in persons office grantee um, back when I was um, leading the human rights department at an NGO. So I am am super focused on making sure that we are using our money in the best way possible. We are, we actually, the GAO reports that have come out um, recently have not only given us sort of, um, they, they have supported that what we're doing is unique and effective, but they absolutely have given us 
specific areas for improvement, and we agree with those areas for improvement, and we are making specific changes, including there was a recommendation to standardize our processes, and so we are doing that in our international programs department. We are increasing accountability by setting target indicators in each of our grants, and we are establishing, which I think is really important, to make sure that we are using the money in the most efficient way possible, we are establishing sustainability plans for each of our grants so that when the money pulls out, we know that our good work will continue to remain in force. Mm -hmm. Finally, Mr. Walsh, uh, speaking about effectiveness of anti-trafficking programming, we know that human trafficking has evolved since the TVPA was first passed in 2000, and that our efforts at addressing human trafficking have had some modest success worldwide. Um, I heard your testimony. I, in my own personal perspective, I think there's much more USAID could be doing. Uh, what type of anti-trafficking programming or advocacy has been most effective? And what type of foreign of our foreign assistance have fallen short and can be improved? Thank you for the question. I think that um, the problem varies so much from region to region that in our instances of most effective programming are often very different from each other and tailored to local circumstances. But as examples of where I think we've been very effective, um, I would cite, for example, in Southeast Asia, we have a number of programs in different countries to target trafficking in the fisheries industry. And because it's offshore, because it's often taking advantage of migrant labor, um, these are populations that are very prone to being exploited. And so I think we have used the full range of our toolkit, including very modern technological solutions that are still very useful to a vulnerable population. So for example, um, reporting mechanisms such that someone who is um, being held against their will on a ship in some facility adjacent to the fisheries industry has a lot more ability to access authorities than, than they maybe had in 2001 when, when this all started. And that's us trying to be flexible. We, pair that with um, a host of civil society organizations that are advocating with the governments of Southeast Asia to apply pressure to tighten safeguards, to work with law enforcement, to watch for this, and with um, support to victims, to survivors, after we've found them. Now that applies to lots of industries. I single out the fisheries one as one where we've found expe especially exploitative circumstances that has grown in recent years. Um, but by, by the same token, I think um, we have tried to help on the migration crisis in the Western Hemisphere by working in both source and transit countries in a variety of ways. So for example, in Guatemala, one effort that we, are, uh, that we think has been especially useful is called, you'll forgive me, I'm not a Spanish speaker, but El Refugio de la Niñez. And it's a, a shelter providing a full range of services to trafficking survivors aimed at um, providing I immediate emergency care, psychosocial help, um, mental support, often physical, medical support, but also helping them to reintegrate into their own communities. Um, sometimes they are from Guatemala and sometimes they started somewhere else. Um, but it, Having a shelter like that and a network of very professionalized support can help um, reduce the likelihood for those who were migrants who were exploited on the way, can help reduce the likelihood of remigration, um, can help target those root causes that send people onward in the first place. Um, and it's been embraced by a lot of the civil society community there. So I could give, you know, there are other examples like Ukraine is a completely different context, obviously, but I think. Um, the fact that we were doing years and years of trafficking work, counter-trafficking work in Ukraine before Putin's further invasion last year gave us this huge uh, base to build upon such that when just the calamity of especially early February 2022 22 hit, there was already in place a national hotline with 6,000 people Res responding to reports of trafficking and like as the problem radically changed, there were tools in place to support that. Mm -hmm. I think that's true across a lot of Ukraine efforts, but it was especially true here. So in each of those cases, those are missions 
targeting local circumstances on their own. We have a fairly decentralized model, but I think that's where it's effective because the problem is so different in those places. Yeah. Well, I'd, I'd like to have my staff follow up with you on a, of few, a few ideas that we have and some perspectives. Senator Risch. Well, <clears throat> thank you. Um, Madam Ambassador, you, you described the uh, situation with scam operations, particularly in Asia, um, and uh, the forced criminality. I, I guess we don't usually think of of that sort of thing when we think of human trafficking. Um, it, obviously, uh, the intersection of those two is, is interesting. Could, could you give us some specific examples of how that works so we can kind of think about this a little more clearly? Thank you so much for that question because it is a really emerging issue that is of critical importance for us to better get our arms around. What we are seeing happening is that there are um, frequently Chinese criminal gangs that are behind this. They are posting job opportunities on Facebook and other social media places that appear to be legitimate. And interesting- In China or in other places? They are, they are posting these in all over the world. We've identified victims from 35 countries. Many times they are from the Philippines and um, Malaysia, Indonesia, but we have identified uh, individuals from Japan, the United States, the UK. But it's emanating from China. Yes. So that's how, I, that's where I get a little confused. How do they enslave someone an ocean away from them? How do they, how do, they do this? Is it? They, they post the job. The individual accepts the job. They are frequently transiting through Thailand or Cambodia. Frequently they're going to these compounds. A lot of these are leftover empty buildings from COVID. They are a lot, they're frequently located in Cambodia, in Burma, across the border from Thailand. Individuals think they're going for a legitimate IT job that is gonna utilize their skills, linguistic skills, IT skills. When they get there, they are literally locked in a room and they are not allowed to leave. And they are given a quota of how much money they have to get from scam operations. And if they don't make that quota, they are tortured, they are deprived of food and water, and so they are under intense pressure to meet this quota. Um, some of these reason we know how this is happening, some of them are have escaped to tell us about it. There was recently, and this was actually in the news, um, a, a cyber scam compound in the Philippines where more than a thousand individuals were located um, and freed, but they were from all over, as we said, 35 countries, targeting a unique population that isn't normally what we think of as the target or vulnerable to trafficking, because these are people with education, linguistic skills, and often IT skills. Interesting. And did you say you had uh, people that got caught up in that even from the United States, is that? Um, yes, sir. There, to my knowledge, so far, there was one individual from the UK, one individual from the US, one individual from Japan, we actually spoke about it when I had the opportunity to, to visit Japan earlier this year. And then many individuals from other Southeast Asian countries, but really they're, they're tar individuals and from Africa. Because one of the benefits is if they get a broad um, target, then that individual can target secondary victims for their online scams from the country that they are from. So they sound like a person from uh, the UK, the US, uh, a country in Africa, and they're more effective at running these romance scams and fraudulent scams. So they're lured there and then held against their will once they get there. Is yes, sir. That how it works? Okay. Yes, sir. Right, my, my time's limited here, but I do want to touch on what I think is probably the, the most obvious uh, uh, matter we hear about in the news, and that's the Uyghurs in China. What, what, uh, tell me about that. What, what do you do about that? What is, what is uh, uh, the efforts that are uh, be, being uh, targeted at that? I think this is a situation where we need to use all tools available. It is not something that there's gonna be a silver bullet for. Thank you, I appreciate you re raising this issue. Um, as, as you will note, the Trafficking in Persons report goes into significant detail about the PRC's um, inappropriate, horrible human rights abuses, specifically their forced labor of Uyghurs and other ethnic and religious minorities frequently located in the Xinjiang Autonomous Region. 
And we are holding, we, so one tool is call it out in the TIP report, not only what China is doing, but also, which we also call out in the TIP report, places where this is occurring in other countries. So for example, we flag in the TIP report that China's Belt and Road Initiative is impacting 13 countries. And so that is brought up in each of those countries' narratives so that those countries can be more aware of what's going on and more proactive to, to ensure that their own citizens are not falling prey to China's tactics, as well as Chinese citizens. But in addition to formal Belt and Road Initiative projects, we also have identified PRC-affiliated projects, not Belt and Road Initiative, but just PRC-affiliated. And we have followed up forced labor trends in 14 additional countries where this is called out. I think that in addition to the TIP report, we need to use and we are using our diplomatic and multilateral diplomacy, bilateral diplomacy to talk to these countries to make sure that people are not unwittingly supporting these programs in, under the guise of getting infrastructure in their country. And a third important area is the Trafficking Persons Office participates in the Forced Labor Enforcement track, uh, Task Force, where we are aggressively working on implementing, thanks to Congress, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. We are adding entities to this list so that we can make sure that Americans are not unwittingly using goods and products that were made by individuals held in slavery in the Xinjiang Autonomous Region. Well, it's a, it's a difficult subject because at the, at the same time that we're trying to tamp down the uh, uh, things that are going on between uh, U.S. and, uh, and China, uh, China is very sensitive to this. They deny it's going on, they deny it's going on and, uh, and say that we're, we're dead wrong on that. So well, how, how do you thread that needle? Very carefully, sir, um, very carefully. I think that we have to both try to improve that diplomatic relationship. I actually believe that we can do what we can from afar. We can work on those, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. We can try to prevent goods from coming in. And certainly we can encourage other countries to do a better job of making sure that they're not unwittingly supporting China through these infrastructure projects. But of course, the best way would be if China changed themselves. And that's only going to happen, as you wisely pointed out, if we can have a better relationship with them. That would be the most, pardon me, direct way. And so I think that we need to use every single one of those tools because this is a problem that's going to require it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Time's up. Thank you. Senator Ricketts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to our panelists for talking about this important topic. Human trafficking is a despicable crime. And not only does it inflict severe trauma on its victims, but it demonstrates just a sickening disregard for human dignity. As governor of Nebraska, I worked with my attorney general, Doug Peterson, and my wife, our first lady, Suzanne Shore, to be able to combat human trafficking in our state with Interstate 80 going through. It's a corridor for this. And we had a, a four-part plan to, to do that. One was raising awareness with regard to the public by using rest areas, educating emergency room docs, letting the public know you've got to be aware for people who have lost control of their phone, you know, don't have control of their phone, don't have control of their ID. In emergency rooms, if you have, for example, a barcode tattoo, those were sorts of things. So our Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services really focused on trying to raise that awareness from that standpoint. We also, secondly, passed laws to strengthen um, the penalties for human trafficking um, and be able to pro uh, prosecute those cases more effectively. Third, we empower law enforcement to more effectively uh, apprehend criminal, criminals through our Operation United Front human trafficking investigation that spanned 12 states. And then finally, we increased the support for survivors uh, who need care and support. I think, Ms. Walsh, you were talking about that as well after experiencing human trafficking. So, Ambassador Dyer, um, how are our U.S. domestic efforts to combat human trafficking perceived internationally, and how do these perceptions positively or negatively affect U.S. foreign policy efforts in this area? Um, first of all, Senator, thank you so much for your work in Nebraska. I noted as you were talking about the things that you focused on that they covered all three of the P's. We have prevention, prosecution, and protection. So thank you for your leadership on that. With regard to the U.S. domestic efforts, we cover in our TIP report the U.S. efforts. And as you will see, we cover them in, in a great deal of detail. <clears throat> 
And we have assessed that overall, the US is actually doing a really good job. We maintain our position as a leader in this space. Um, we, have, we are increasing um, not only identified victims, increased prosecutions, identified um, increasing numbers of victims who are receiving services, as you wisely pointed out, from government protect uh, government pr funded programs, all of this is laid out. Obviously, as every country, even those that are on a tier two, we have room for improvement. We absolutely have room for improvement. One of the things then, that we have specifically said is that we need to do a better job of making sure that victims of trafficking are not held or penalized for crimes that they were forced but, to be doing. But uh, with the efforts the United States doing, I, I, I got to believe that helps us when we're trying to make the case internationally that other countries need to do more as well. I completely agree with you, sir. When we are engaging in our bilateral and multilateral diplomacy, it helps our position when we are recommending changes to other countries, when we can say, look, we hold ourselves accountable too. We recognize when we do stuff good, and we recognize when there's room for improvement. And I think that that really strengthens our case and makes that diplomacy much more effective. Right. I want to switch gears and build on what uh, Senator Rich was talking about with regard to the Uyghurs in Xinjiang province. And you know, about a million Uyghurs have been put into these forced labor camps, and about 100,000 are actually doing this forced labor, uh, I should say re-education camps, the million, 100,000 in forced labor. Um, this is just despicable what the PRC is doing, and I certainly understand the challenges that we have in trying to raise awareness with the countries that are supporting this. Uh, what further actions does the State Department plan to take to implement the UFLPA and uh, its coordination with the Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force participation. Um, the the JTIP participates in that Forced Labor Enforcement Task Force, and one of our chief um, missions is to fully implement the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act, the UFLPA. What we have been doing so far, we, as you know, w the UFLPA allows anything that is from the Xinjiang region or made with goods to be put on a list that will be preventing those products from coming into the United States. But in addition, each of the members of that Force Labor Enforcement Task Force can recommend entities to be added to that list. So even if it's not something that's clearly based in that region, that is the um, that is the area that we've been working most on. We you may have seen that we recently uh, voted and add two added two additional entities to that list. That um, that process is ongoing. In fact, I was working on that earlier before I came in today. <laughs> so what what challenges do we have? Because European goods are still making it into the European marketplace. What are some of the challenges, and what can we do about it to prevent this? I mean, this is terrible. That <clears throat> The, the goods made by forced labor in the People's Republic of China are making their way into Europe. This is just horrible. It's despicable. I think there are two challenges, and I appreciate you, you asking about them. Number one is we have to be sure that we're doing our due diligence because these supply chains are extremely complicated. They are complex, and the PRC is engaging in active subterfuge to hide and, and um, make it difficult to see, to, cle to see clearly these change. Um, it's one of the areas that we actually mentioned in the Trafficking in Persons report, this affirmative effort to make it hard to check to see how the supply chains are working. Um, so this is actually something we brought up. And we want to be sure that we're doing our due diligence. And so that is what is the most difficult part. We are actively engaging on it now to be sure that we are correctly and accurately assessing it so that we can prevent Americans from unwittingly purchasing these products. Right. Thank you very much. Chairman? Thank you. I just have one or two final questions. Um, in December of last year, the Treasury Department imposed sanctions under the Global Magnitsky Program targeting individuals and companies involved in human trafficking abuses. One set of actions targeted forced labor aboard distant water fishing vessels operating out of China. The other targeted a national of the Philippines for sex trafficking and the rape of young girls. So, Ambassador, given the global Magnitsky sanctions and other targeted sanction programs are only rarely used for human trafficking, is this something we can expect to see more actions like these in the future? And can you tell us what role you see for increasing the use of targeted sanction tools in the broader U.S. effort to address human trafficking? Uh, thank you, Senator. I believe that using the use of these sanctions is one important tool. 
we shouldn't put all of our eggs into that one basket, but it is absolutely an important tool. And the TIP office is responding to that by actually creating a specialized individual in our office, a very senior, knowledgeable, whip smart um, uh, foreign service officer who is focused exclusively on identifying additional targets for global Magnitsky sanctions. We were very heartened to see that several of the successful sanctions did involve forced labor, the ones that you pointed out, um, and so we are actually putting additional effort, but please know that while we put that in and we are aggressively seeking additional names to seek global magnetsy sanctions, we are not putting all our eggs. This is something that we are doing in addition to the TIP report, our programming, our bilateral and multilateral diplomacy. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask you another question. Migrant laborers are three times more likely to be trafficked than others are. How's the State Department addressing the trafficking of migrant laborers, given they're often difficult to track uh, and too frightened to share their experiences? And, and do you know when the administration's global labor strategy will finally be released? Um, with regard to your first question regarding migration, I am grateful to you for bringing it up and I appreciate your focus on this because we absolutely do know that migrants are uniquely vulnerable to human trafficking. They have many of the characteristics that human traffickers are seeking. They're afraid to call the police, they're on the move, they're desperate, they don't necessarily have a plan. Um, our part, the trafficking in persons part in addressing the unique vulnerabilities to trafficking of migrants is several fold. One is we are tracking the risks, not only in the home countries, but along the migration pathways. And then we are engaging in uh, intense bilateral and multilateral diplomacy and discussions with those countries so that they are aware of their own risks. And we've actually pulled them out in the trafficking in persons report. We use that tip report in our discussions with them to show here is where you have areas of risk. In addition, we are specifically encouraging these countries that are along the migration route to do a better job of screening migrants, referring them to services, and then making sure that comprehensive services actually are available for those who do show signs of being trafficked. We are also using our foreign assistance in a very targeted way to make sure that we, we are actually supporting some of the regional approaches. We recognize that migration is not something that the United States is gonna solve alone. We have gotta have not only a whole of government approach, but a whole of region approach. And so we're really working closely with our allies and countries and partners in the region. And the last thing that we're doing is making sure that as we are creating safe, legal migration, pardon me, as we're, as we're creating lawful migration pathways, we want to make sure that those pathways do not have inherent vulnerabilities built into them. We want to make sure there's no ability to have extreme labor recruitment fees so that when they come into the U.S., they owe so much money that that can be used against them. We want to make sure that they're not inappropriately tied to a specific worker and that they can leave if there's an abuse. And so once again, I feel like this is sort of a, a whole comprehensive response and we're doing our best to make sure that we have this really balanced approach. And the global labor strategy oh, is part of that? Thank you, sir. I actually checked on that before I came because I thought you might ask. Um, it has not been released yet and I do not have a specific time frame on when it is coming. I know it is being worked on and I'm happy to get back with you to let you know the latest I'd, update. I'd appreciate knowing that. Finally, Mr. Walsh, uh, we know that lack of protections for workers can drive human trafficking. If we hope to end forced labor, we have to increase our focus not just on prosecutions from my perspective, but on support for workers' rights. We know worker-driven social responsibility programs can prevent human trafficking. Do you, what are your views on that? And is USAID using resources and pivoting programs to invest more in expanding labor rights? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you for the question. I would say <clears throat> our flagship um, worker rights program is the Global Labor Program, which you've been amazing supporters of for decades now. Um, that works all over the world, especially to support unions, um, other forms of collective bargaining organization. 
Um, but we have tried to, uh, a couple years ago when the Global Labor Program increased by a few million dollars, we tried to use it to get at some of the most vulnerable populations that we maybe weren't getting at before and who often don't have access to the traditional tools of organization. So in it's kind of two um, nascent programs. One is in um, East Africa and one's in Southeast Asia and they target um, migrant workers who often are in the informal economy, sometimes you could call it the gig economy, um, and it gives them tools to report abuses that may or may not cross the line into trafficking literally, but are often quite abusive. Um, uh, it provides services to them, um, whether it's legal assistance, the kinds of medical and mental help that I referenced before. Um, and then uh, in East Africa, it's focused especially on, again, migrant, often informal economy workers, but who are uh, often women or people with disabilities, like so really the most vulnerable, um, and trying to provide those same services. And I, I would also just say that under the Global Labor Program, um, there have been a lot of questions about the Uyghurs, Xinjiang, like one of, if not the defining human rights atrocities of our age. And something that USAID is trying to do is to focus really on the forced labor part of this problem. And so I would kind of echo what Ambassador Dyer said in that the, the devilishly complicated part of this is, is how tangled, marbled supply chains are and, and how difficult it can be to find where the forced labor is. And so we are trying to help solve that problem by commissioning what I, what I would say is some of the most useful action-oriented research that I've ever come across in my government career. And it aims at, first we did this for the cotton industry, which is central in Xinjiang, and then we did it for the automotive industry, different parts of the automotive industry. And it's aimed at finding what factories, what companies, what specific facilities either are demonstrably em employing forced labor or are very suspicious um, to be. There are others who've done this work on the outside for other industries, but it, it is so important to have a lot of eyes on this problem, identifying specifics. And that's both inside and outside of China, because a lot of times the, the supply line is, or the use of forced labor is somewhere else. With that information in hand, it gives us the ability to start advocacy and to start going to companies to break themselves free of, of this enormous blight on their operations, um, sometimes to work with governments to shut down loopholes or individual areas. So it, it's kind of a two-part play, like find the forced labor and then, and then go after it. But I think we can make kind of an outsized contribution with a relatively small amount of money in this way. Mm -hmm. Well, if I, if I was a, a purchaser of supplies, anything I saw from Xinjiang would raise my antenna. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that you have a million Uyghurs in a concentration camp. There's a high probability that you're going to end up uh, with, um, with trafficked uh, products and supplies. Um, Senator Rich? Uh, uh, no, nothing further, Mr. Chairman, except to say thank you. you. You guys are doing heaven's work. There's no question about it. We appreciate what you do. Well, we, on behalf of the committee, we thank you both for your testimony. Thank you for the very insightful ambassador uh, aspects you gave. And, very succinct. I think you should give the State Department a course on how to answer questions um, that are substantive. Uh, at the end of the day, they would very well avail themselves. There's a couple uh, of other that. agencies you can include. <laughs> Senator Vich suggests there are other agencies as well. I'll be just happy if you can get the State Department to do that. So the record for this hearing will remain open until the close of business on Friday, June 23rd. Uh, please ensure that questions for the record are submitted no later than tomorrow. And with the thanks of the committee, this hearing is adjourned.